and um, let's see what happens here tonight. See if God will do something special in this church. Exodus chapter 12, verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out, take you a lamb according to your families, kill the Passover. Ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service. And of course, Passover is continuing even to this day. And then it says, um, let's see. Verse 26, and it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service that ye shall say? It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and they worshipped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. And I'm going to preach to you for just a little bit tonight. I don't have a ton of notes here this evening, so we'll just see how this goes. But I want to preach to you on this subject, applying the blood, applying the blood. Lord, talk to our hearts tonight, God. Instruct us, Lord God, in righteousness. Direct our paths. Help us to receive with meekness that engrafted word which is able to save our souls. I pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Throughout the years, many have heard it preached concerning how it was that the blood of animals was a necessity under the Old Testament law. Not for the purpose of removing sin, but instead to temporarily cover those sins. We also understand that a year later, more sacrifice had to be made, and so it continued for what seemed like forever. We know that God's people after the death of Joseph had gone into Egyptian bondage basically for the worship of false gods, also idolatry. They were in an idolatrous country. They had their idols to their false gods. I mean, the Egyptians had false gods that numbered in the thousands. And so this was what they saw. They got caught up in these things. And now, here they are. They've done the forbidden. The scriptures emphatically teach, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God's people had sown disobedience and now they were reaping a 400-year whirlwind. But then God's people began crying out to their God by reason of their bondage. In other words, they'd had enough of building pyramids. They had had enough of unfair treatment. And so they're crying out to God, saying, God save us. God, we remember the old teachings. God save us. 
They turned their faces toward home. And God said, okay. He sends to them a Moses. He sends to them an Aaron. Their purpose was to speak to Pharaoh. Moses then said to this ruler, let God's people go. Pharaoh's response, I just don't think so. And now here come the God sent plagues upon the people. First came the plague of blood. God literally turned the river Nile to blood. The Nile was the source that the Egyptians claimed that life had sprang from. Only now, the supposed life-giving river is now thick with blood. It's smelly, it's foul. The fish, no telling how many fish, had died. It's truly a world-class mess. And yet this did not move this Pharaoh. Then came the plague of the frogs. We know that frogs live in and around the waters. The waters had been turned to blood. This drove the frogs from the rivers, from the ponds, into the streets, into the houses, into the baths, into their beds, into their ovens. Everywhere the Egyptians went, there was nothing but frogs. And yet even the great frog infestation did not move the king. And came the plague of the gnats. Pesky, annoying, biting gnats were everywhere. I used to play golf, and sometimes I'd go out in the mornings, and there wouldn't be a whole lot of people on the golf course. And um, I'd just be walking along, and here would come the gnats. And boy, they'd just get all over you, in your hair, up your nose, all over the place. And and we weren't talking about an infestation. We're talking about just out in the early morning hours. And can you imagine the plague of the gnats that had taken over Egypt? I mean, they were tormenting. They were, I mean, just making people uh, all sorts of nervous, upset, uncomfortable. And yet even the great infestation of gnats did not turn Pharaoh's heart from his stubbornness. Next came the plague of the flies. If one fly is within a hundred miles of me, it doesn't matter whether I'm in my car or in the restaurant that I'm eating in, that fly is going to get into that restaurant, and I'm going to have to be swatting him away. He's going to find me, I promise you. And yet there were billions upon billions upon billions of flies that were everywhere. They could go nowhere without flies being the dominating force of the day. And yet even the flies didn't move this Pharaoh to change his mind. Then came the disease on the cattle. Cattle began dropping like flies that were hit with the pesticide. This meant much of Egypt's food supply was dwindling away very rapidly. This did not move the Pharaoh. Six came boils from head to toe. The Egyptians were covered with oozing, infected, nasty, painful boils. They were miserable beyond belief. But this did not move the Pharaoh. Seventh came the hail. Crops were ready, but when the hail got through, their crops were only dregs. They were only leftovers from the consumption of this hail. This didn't move the Pharaoh. Then came the locusts. The crops untouched by the hail were now eaten by the locusts. Can you see misery here? This is a miserable place during this time in this area of the world. So the locusts eat what's left. Next came darkness that was so thick, it was so concentrated, 
that it could actually be felt. It was so heavy, so burdensome, so depressing, so powerful that people felt the oppressive nature of that darkness. I, I can sense in my spirit great depression, great fear. You, Brother Nathan used to live in Alaska, and there's, there's certain times of the year when you don't get a whole lot of daylight in Alaska and high suicide rate in that nation because people get depressed. People get down when they, ha- when they can't see daylight and it's just dark or twilight all of the time. Can you imagine this nation dealing with this oppressive darkness that was, that was so strong, that was so powerful that it literally oppressed them. They could feel it in their members. And yet this didn't move Pharaoh. But then came plague number 10, the worst plague of all. This plague being the death angel being dispatched. Let's read it again, Exodus 12, 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel, said unto them, Draw out, take you a lamb according to your families, kill the Passover, take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, strike it on the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you according as he promised that ye shall keep this service. It shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So did they. Now you would think that God, you would think that the death angel would have been able to tell who was Egyptian and who was Hebrew. But it wasn't about knowing who was who. It was about a type. It was about a shadow being set for things to come. Namely the blood of Jesus being shed for the sins of this old sin sick world. The blood on doorposts and lintels spoke of the essential need of the blood of the spotless lamb of God being supplied to lives by way of water baptism in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Get this, church family. The Hebrews slew the Passover lamb. The blood of the lamb was placed in a basin. However, the blood had to then be struck on the lintel. This was the top of the door. It had to be struck on the doorpost. It did no good while it was sitting in the basin. It had to be applied to doorposts. It had to be applied to lentils. If it wasn't, bad things were coming even to God's people. And we find these bad things in verse 29, again of Exodus 12. It came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh arose up in the night he and all of his servants all the Egyptians and there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house where there was not one dead and you know what he did he called for Moses and Aaron by night none of those plagues moved him but suddenly 
God's got this old reprobate's attention. And he said, rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as ye have said. Also take your flocks, don't want them around here. Take your herds, don't want them around there as ye have said, and be gone. And by the way, leave a blessing while you're on the way out. And the Egyptians were urging upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened. Their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. And they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required and they spoiled the Egyptians. Friends, I want all of you to understand this. The blood of the lamb had to be applied for the blood to be effectual. And I've got news for you here tonight. It's got to be applied to your life. I'm talking about the blood of the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. It's got to be applied to your life for it to be effectual. Hyssop had to be taken as a paintbrush. Then it had to be dipped and then the blood had to be struck on the doorpost and the lintels. While it's true without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, no removal of sins. It's also true without the applying of the blood, there can be no remission. You can have the blood in a basin. You can have the blood and say, oh, that, that, that we know about Jesus. We know about the power in the name. But unless the blood is applied, it's not doing any good in your life. The blood of the Passover had to be applied for them to escape Pharaoh paralleling this today. We must have the blood of the Christ, the blood of Jesus applied to each and every one of our lives to escape certain disaster of an eternity without God. I've got to have the blood of Jesus applied to the doorpost and the lintels of my life. I've got to have the blood of Jesus Applied to my world. Hallelujah. I'm saying the blood of Christ must be applied to our lives if we want to be on the right side of the rapture. I don't know about you, but I plan on going in the rapture of the church. How about you? If you want to go, you've got to have the blood applied to your life. And we find in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 10, Wherefore, when he, when Jesus cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hadst had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, then said Jesus, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, he taketh away the animal sacrifices that he may establish the second by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You see, it was the blood of Jesus that took away the old. <laughs> it was the blood of Jesus that made a way for mankind to be permanently liberated from the effects, from the sin, sting of sin. In fact, it was during the crucifixion in John chapter 19 that we find how removal of sin 
would actually work. Jesus has just been crucified. And again, John 19, 32, we find here, then came the soldiers. They break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with them. We're talking here about the thieves on the cross. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. Notice that when they pierced Jesus' side, both things came out. This was significant in that it spoke to the world about the synonymous nature of the blood of Jesus and the waters of baptism. Then we find in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But then he turns it all around, saying, And such were some of you, but ye are washed This speaks of the washing of our sins by water baptism in Jesus' name. For there is none of the name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Friends, if you're going to be saved, it's going to come through the name of Jesus that invokes the blood of Jesus. You've got to have the blood. You've got to have the blood of Jesus applied to your life. Such were some of you, but ye are washed. Hallelujah. Then it said, but ye are sanctified. This speaks of sinners becoming pure in God's sight. This is what happens when we're baptized in Jesus' name. But that's not all. It goes on to say, but ye are justified. In other words, you're rendered innocent in God's sight. And and this happens. We are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So we are washed, we are sanctified, we are justified in the name of Jesus. We take on the name when we go into the water in Jesus' name. Our sins are removed. Hallelujah. We become innocent in the Lord's sight. Friends, nothing like being baptized in the name of Jesus. Nothing like receiving the Spirit of God into your life. You want to talk about the weight of the world being on your shoulders when you're baptized in Jesus' name, when you receive the Spirit of God. I'm telling you that load, that weight comes off of your shoulders. Why? Because you have taken a step not only toward God, but you've taken a step into the very kingdom of God. And so we are washed, we are sanctified, we are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You say, well, I just don't get it, Brother Sartre. How do we get hold of these things? This morning I preached a message about emptying ourselves of sin and weights. This is what repentance is all about. When we repent, when we make a decision that We're going to live pleasing. We're going to live favorably before the Lord. When we repent, what happens is we empty ourselves of weights. And when we empty ourselves of weights, God helps us along the way. He he removes barriers standing between He and ourselves. and, And we can then receive God's Spirit into our lives. I don't know how many were praying this morning, but quite a few people were praying. And friends, let me tell you something. If you're repenting and you're praying and you're magnifying God and suddenly you you don't recognize what you're saying, let me tell you what's happened in your life. You've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's God letting you know that you've received my spirit into your life. You want to talk about a powerful happening I'll never forget the night I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I'll tell you what, when it happens to you, you'll never forget that moment in your life. And so when we repent, God begins removing barriers that are standing between He and us. And and we can then receive His Spirit into our lives. 
friends, nothing like it. So enjoy it. Enjoy it. Hallelujah. Nothing like the Spirit of God. Nothing like having the blood of Jesus applied to your life. I, I remember getting out of that baptismal tank in New Orleans Church. I remember getting the Holy Ghost in service and I told my dad, I said, what if the rapture takes place tonight? I don't want to miss the rapture because I hadn't been baptized in Jesus' name. So he called Brother Cupid and said, Brother Cupid, can we come use the baptistry? At that time, we had a little church over on Clare Avenue. Didn't even have a baptistry in the church. That was rectified pretty quick after my dad took the church. But it took a little while to get that done. So he called Brother Cupid and Brother Cupid said, come on. I remember it was cold in that church. They did not have a heater in that baptistry. And if I hadn't gotten the Holy Ghost, I'd have probably gotten stammering lips pretty quick. But I got in that water, and they put me under that water in Jesus' name. And when I came up out of that water, hallelujah, it was like the weight of the world had been lifted from my shoulders. Friends, we can have the blood in the basin, but we got to get the blood applied to our lives. And it happens when we go under the water in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Nothing like it. Nothing like it. Jesus' blood washes us. It renders us innocent. It makes us clean before him. More proof of the rightness of these things is found in the words of the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter is asked by a gathered crowd, what must we do? What do we need to do in order to be cleansed, to receive God's Spirit? And listen to what he said. Then Peter said unto them, you've got to repent. In other words, you've got to empty all of that weight, all of that, you got to get emptied. you got to get all of that junk out of your life. He said you've got to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Listen to this. For the promise is unto you. It's to your children. It's to all that are afar off. Not some that are afar off. It's to all that are afar off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And here we sit 2,000 years later and God's still calling. I said, God's still calling. Thank God you're still calling, Lord. Hallelujah. In closing, let me read Paul's words. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, one more time. I want to read it one more time where he said, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you but you're washed. Our sins have been cleansed. God himself forgets what we did. He says, I don't even want to look at that anymore. And then it said, but you're justified. You are rendered innocent in my sight. Hallelujah. How do these things happen? In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. If you don't have the blood of Jesus applied to your life on this night, you need to get the blood of Jesus applied to your life by way of baptism in the name of Jesus. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you need to get hold of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's God's greatest gift to man. His blood, His Spirit, his power, ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witness. Praise the Lord. Let's stand. The old song said it like this, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, 
precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's lift our hands and thank the Lord for the blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's thank him for the blood of Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place tonight. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place tonight. I wonder what would have happened one of the Hebrews said well I'm a Hebrew I'm just not going to put the blood on my doorpost I think the firstborn would have died because it wasn't about whether they were Hebrew or Egyptian it was about whether they had the blood I got to have the blood I got to have the blood hallelujah I feel like ending this service a little bit different tonight if you've got a need of any kind whatsoever, maybe you want to be baptized in the name of Jesus tonight. Baptismal waters are warm. You don't have to go through what I went through. Hallelujah. If you want to be baptized, you can be. If you want Lord, the Lord to just give you comfort and peace, you want God to just help you, whatever situation you find yourself in, you to just take a step of faith toward the Lord tonight, no matter what it is. If you need anything from the Lord, I just want you to take a step of faith toward the Lord. I'm telling you, the Lord will minister to you tonight in a mighty way. Whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever it is, come on, come on. Come on, take that step of faith. Whatever the need is, come on. Take that step of faith. Take that step of faith. 